Good morning and welcome back to History of Interiors. Today we're going to go over the French Baroque style, which is strongly associated with the rule of Louis XIV. So starting off with the important figures of the time, you do have Louis XIV, um, who had a very long and stable reign. He's actually the longest recorded of any monarch of a sovereign country in history, with his reign lasting 72 years and 110 days. Um, and under his influence, art flourished. So one thing about his reign being so long, if you consider it um, in context of how many revolutions France is about to have, having a leader stay in power for 72 years allowed them to have incredible stability for the arts to flourish. However, he is still known for having a large ego, which would drive a major wedge between the aristocracy and the average French citizen. So while his reign was incredibly stable, it wasn't necessarily good for all people involved. And um, this will be one of the facets that leads to the eventual revolutions in France. The next person we're going to look at is Fouquet. Um... And he was the finance minister under, under Louis XIV. He had a beautiful country home known as the Volet Vicomte. Um, and we'll look at this more in just a moment. But he ended up being imprisoned for peculation, which is a maladministration of state funds. And Louis XIV imprisoned him for this, and he remained in prison for 19 years until his death. Um, so Louis, going back to him for just one moment to kind of make that story make a little bit more sense, he was one of the first monarchs to truly bring absolutism to Europe, so he wanted full control over everything in his, um, system of government, which once again feeds into that really large ego idea. All right, so what you're looking at here is an image of the Vaux les Vicomtes, um, and it was the inspiration for the Palace of Versailles that Louis himself will build. Um, and so this chateau is situated near the northern end of a 1.5 kilometer long north-south axis, with the entrance front facing north. The elevations are perfectly symmetrical on either side of this axis, and somewhat surprisingly, the interior plan is also nearly completely symmetrical, with few differences between the eastern and western halves. Visitors to this um, chateau actually walk through the building along that axis that we just spoke about, to get to the central axis of the garden. So remember, these buildings were part of a landscape, um, and there were incredible gardens surrounding this building. And the main reason that we want to study this is actually because of its influence over the Palace of Versailles. Um, so you still see those signature roofs that we looked at with the... Um, I'm sorry, French Renaissance style, but we are also going to look at the interiors a little bit more, and that's what's really going to shape this and place it during the Baroque period. Alright, so here you can see an image of the Palace of Versailles, and if you'll notice, this central part here um, looks almost exactly like that building that we just studied, the Volet Vicomte. Um, and one of the main things that, like I said, I want to bring up time and time again because of how important it is, is how the gardens are integrated into the space. So everything was thought out and carefully planned. Um, and so you see this central walkway that follows that same axis that we were seeing before um, and lays out a symmetrical plan on either side. This is what the palace looks like today. Um, it was at one point um, surrounded by much more expansive gardens than we can currently see, but these parterre gardens are really signatures of the French um, style following the French Renaissance. All 
All right, so this is just a different angle of the Palace of Versailles, and don't worry, we're going to get into all of the history that you need to know about this building in just a couple of slides, but this shows you a different view, and you'll notice that there's different styles being implemented throughout, so you still see those beautiful gardens um, that are quite expansive and surround Versailles. But you also see the use of several different styles. It looks different from this direction, which is walking up towards the front, um, than it did from the back. So all of those different angles definitely would have been considered when designing this space. And here is just another view. You can notice that just like in the Renaissance style, we still see the use of a water feature which definitely would have been absolutely necessary to maintain these elaborate gardenscapes and landscape architecture that was signature to the French style. All right, so this is what an image um, looks like of what the patrons see when they first walk up to Versailles. Um, so this is, if you were to go and visit today, exactly what you would see. Um, and now we're going to dive into a bit of the history of this palace. So when the King of France, Louis XIV, first decided to build a new palace and move his court out of Paris, there was nothing on his chosen site at Versailles but a smallish hunting lodge. Today, the palace stands as a prime example of the over-the-top access of the French nobility that led to the French Revolution. Thanks to the team of Louis Le Vau, who was um, an architect to the aristocracy, André Le Notre, who was the landscape designer, and Charles Le Brun, um, who was the interior decorator and painter, Louis XIV's enormous and stylish palace was completed 21 years after it was begun in 1661, allowing Louis to officially set up court there. Enormous is no joke. The palace has 700 rooms, 2,153 2, windows, and takes up 67,000 square meters of floor space. Over and above anything else, Versailles was meant to emphasize Louis's importance. After all, this guy called himself the Sun King, as in everything revolves around me. Um... But by building Versailles, Louis shifted the seat of the French government away from the feuding, gossiping, troublemaking noble families in Paris. He had the whole place and its massive gardens built along an east-west axis so the sun would rise and set in alignment with his home. And he filled both the palace and its garden with sculpture, painting, and fountains that all focused on himself. When you walk through the palace at Versailles, you're bombarded with room after room of marble and gold and paintings, ceilings painted to place Louis in the company of the Greek gods, bust of him in huge formal curly wigs staring at you wherever you go, and gold, 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 so you never lose sight of how wealthy the King of France was. To give you just a hint, we're talking about a man who spent the equivalent of five million on buttons over 54 years of his reign. That's an average of almost $100,000 a year on buttons alone. Of, of the 700 rooms inside the palace, there are a few notable ones that served very particular functions. The king's official state bedroom is one where the incredibly detailed lever and kosher rituals would be performed each day. Both involved a host of courtiers waiting on the king while he got up or went to bed, following strict rules of position and rank to determine who got to perform which parts of the ceremony. The Queen of France, who lived at Versailles, were the focus of similar rituals. Um, the symmetrical Salon of War and Salon of Peace are decorated with paintings highlighting, unsurprisingly, France's military might and the benefits of living calmly under a tranquil, ruling government. And the Cabinet des Chins, um, which is literally the study for dogs, was a room that Louis XV valets shared with his dogs, who got to sleep in a room full of gilding and painted decoration. 
So we're actually going to save some more conversation about the interiors for another time because we are going to get into those in just a moment. But like I said, this was ex intended to be lavish. It was meant to show the wealth and the might of the king, um, which will eventually lead, like I said, to those French revolutions. Here you can see a drawing of how Versailles looked when it was first built, so you can see how expansive the gardens are in comparison to what we can see today, but overall the main shape and style of it remain the same. So this is an etching of the Palace of Versailles circa 1680, and you can see how different it looks while still being quite expansive. You've got the beautiful um, fountain out front. Um, but you still get to see all of those buildings that fall kind of back behind this main entrance and the expansive gardens that surrounded it. And this is just another view of those um, buildings as well as all of the expansive gardens that would have been surrounding it. Now all of this main area in the background would be covered by trees or other buildings that are located around here but um, it definitely would have stood out and been incredibly beautiful as it was one of the main things um, in the area. There weren't all of those additional buildings around it yet. All right, so here is just one last view of how it looked. Um, so you can see, once again, it's truly expansive and it would have needed to be, right, to hold the entire French court. Um, so for as much as this was about showing how lavish and extravagant they could possibly be, it also was in some degree not to the expanse that Louis XIV took it, but it was to some degree functional, right? You needed the military, you needed um, all of those ladies-in-waiting, and um, I'm sure many of you have watched historical TV shows of some form that kind of depict just how large the court can be and how much is needed to make that happen. So it wasn't just his direct family, it was also all of the noblemen, the knights, everyone needed a place to stay, and it certainly didn't need to be this large or expansive, which is why the French public had such an issue with it, but ultimately it was in some degree functional for them. All right, so all of these names I talked about earlier, so we're not going to spend too long on this slide, but I do want you to see um, how to spell all of them, should you need to know that. So you have Laval, who was the architect of the Palace of Versailles, Le Brun, who was the decorator, um, and Le Notre, who was the landscape architect. Then you also have André Charles Bouillet, um, who was a famous cabinet maker, and he made a lot of the pieces for Versailles. So this just dives into why the features or structures that we just spoke about are so important. So that Vaux le Vicomte um, served as the inspiration for the Palace of Versailles. Um, it was important in its own right as well, just for its historical context and place. Foucault spent a good bit of his money on that to once again show his wealth as he was rivaling um, Louis XIV to kind of find out where his power lied um, as Louis was becoming more and more of an absolute monarch and Foucault felt like he was losing his footing and his influence. Then we've got the Palace of Versailles, which holds 10,000 people. So like I just mentioned, a couple of slides ago, it seems extreme, and it definitely was, but they were also trying to house essentially a whole um, town's worth of people, so they were building a chateau that could hold all of that. Um, and then it was also magnificent in design and decoration, once again just going back to the he spent five million dollars on buttons alone. Um, so truly just extravagance to the extreme. You also have the Hall of Mirrors, which is famous today for the signing of several treaties, so specifically the Treaty of Versailles. 
Um, and then it resembles the nave of St. Peter's, which is also a Baroque building. And we're going to look at the Hall of Mirrors now. All right, so on this slide, you see an image of the Hall of Mirrors. Um, this was a hallway that connected the room that was the um, Salon of War and the Salon of Peace. So those are what is on opposite ends of this hallway. And um, this is the most famous room at the Palace of Versailles, which runs along the entire length of the central building. One wall contains a row of giant windows looking out over the gardens, and the other wall is covered with 357 mirrors that catch the setting sun's rays inside the palace and remind us yet again of Louis XIV's power. Though the room is over the top in its grandeur, it was mainly used as a passageway. After the king got up for the day, he proceeded through this mirrored hall to his private chapel, and as many courtiers as could fit would squeeze in, waiting for their chance to beg a favor of the king as he passed by them. Since Louis XIV's day, the room has been used for parties and military agreements. And here you can see a closer up image. Um, you see all of this heavily ornate detail um, and you also see the mirrors, which is obviously where this specific room gets its name. Um, but those mirrors are incredibly important because they also serve as a means of showing wealth. Um, mirrors would have been incredibly expensive to make at the time that this was being built. So the fact that um, he owned any at all was a big deal. Most people did not have access to even a small mirror like we would find in a makeup compact today. So to line an entire hallway with mirrors just seemed um, bizarre and outrageously excessive to the French people. Um, you can also see all of the elaborate paintings and the um, beautiful chandeliers. Um, and this lavish style really goes to showcase the baroque right that is the style of this it can be overdone pretty easily but all of those beautiful gilded frameworks and um, all of the molding and everything here it's not so much a recall of antiquity but rather just an extremely lavish baroque interior all right, so on this slide, you see a direct side-by-side -side of the nave of St. Peter's and the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, um, and you can tell that they both have that same barrel vaulted ceiling shape as well as arches lining each side. Um, in Versailles, those arches are mirrored, whereas in the um, nave of St. Peter's, they are open. However, you notice the similarities between the two almost immediately. Um, and remember how much power the Vatican had, so by mimicking that in any form or fashion, you're also mimicking the amount of power that you have by combining both of those. Um, but overall, in general, you can see the distinctive line that connects the um, French Baroque period to the Italian Baroque period because they do have many similar elements. Um, look at the moldings that you can see here. Um, while the coloring in the photograph is obviously different, you can still tell that they use a lot of the same elements between the two. All right, so on this slide you can see an image of the Versailles Chapel in the Palace of Versailles which is where Louis XIV, as well as his successors, would have spent their daily worship time. You'll notice the continuation of a lot of gold gilding throughout the space, um, which once again was intended to be luxurious and lavish. Louis XIV felt no need to spare any expense when building this palace, and it really shows throughout all of these moldings um, that are completely covered in gold gilding. 
So here you can see a more zoomed in image of that chapel um, in the Palace of Versailles and you'll notice the use of Corinthian columns throughout. Um, as we've discussed before, these, these are the most decorative form of Greek column to exist, which is probably why he looked into these and chose these specifically. Um, you can also see how the beautiful barrel vault ends in this beautifully painted rounded out image here that is above the organ. Um, but overall, just remember the use of gold throughout the space, which was intended to show just how much money Louis had to spend, um, and boy did he spend it. <laughs> Alright, so here is an image looking up at the ceiling, and you can see how much light is let in by the clerestory windows. Um, remember that Louis called himself the Sun King, so he wanted to bring in as much light as possible, and that is one of the things that really defines this palace as a whole, but specifically this space and the Hall of Mirrors, is just how much light is being let in. Um, especially when you consider that because of the location of this room and how it sits on that axis from east to west, it would have had sunlight in it at all times of the day except for before sunrise and before sunset. Um, so it's not like if this room was placed on a north-south axis and those windows weren't catching the light at all hours. Alright, so now we're going to go over the interior elements that really define the Baroque style. We're going to keep looking at these through the lens of the Palace of Versailles, but first you'll notice, um, and you've probably already noticed up to this point, the exaggerated opulence. Everything is over the top, everything is dramatic, it's rich in color and um, all of the metallic use that's there. Every piece of every room has detail to it, right? Nothing is left blank, nothing is toned down or um, muted, everything is very bold, it's large scale and heavy. Um, and then we also see the use of wall panels of wood, which are um, boiserie. Sorry, I will find out how to pronounce that, I promise. Um, because it's not going to go away. It's something that we see in a lot of French styles, um, and one of the things that becomes quite attached to the French style of building. Versailles also has a distinct parquet pattern, um, so we've seen parquet floors before, if you will recall, but um, they're done a little bit differently in Versailles, and so we are able to see how this specific type of flooring and the pattern that it lays out goes on to influence the rest of the world and um, is seen in many buildings. You'll also notice the use of rich carving and strong color, and this is not um, unsimilar to the Italian Baroque style. All of these elements are pretty similar but done in a uniquely French way. Alright, so the first room that we're going to look at is the Room of Peace. Um, as you can tell, it's definitely exaggerated and heavy. Um, everything is done in a very large scale. You can see the wall paneling, so those things that look like separations almost on the wall. Um, and then it has the distinctive parquet pattern in the flooring, that diamond look. Um, and you can also see like rich carvings, especially in the moldings, and a really strong use of color in the art. So the piece room is symmetrical to the war room and contains the same marble panel decoration and chased trophies of arms in gilded bronze. Here, however, Lebron um, decorated the cupola and arches on themes of the benefits of peace brought to Europe by France. 
From the beginning of Louis XIV's reign, this room was separated from the hall by a movable partition and was considered to be part of the Queen's apartment, constituting the final room after the Queen's chamber. During the reign of Louis XV, every Sunday, um, Marie Lizinariska, I'm so sorry on these names, um, gave concerts of religious or secular music, which played an important role in the musical life in Versailles, and which were continued by Marie Antoinette during the subsequent reign. When required, the partition separating the room from the Hall of Mirrors was removed, and the room formed part of the King's State Apartment. Um, so that's just another interesting note on this, that they are going to associate the Room of Peace with the Queen um, and with the female figure of the household. And then we're going to look next at the Room of War, which would have been associated with the King or the male head of the household. All right, so here you see that opposing room, so the Room of War, um, but you can tell it is still decorated in a very similar style, and you see all of those same interior features that I spoke of from the wall panelings. So if you see here, like a full-on panel, um, and then you can see just how exaggerated um, and lavish and luxurious this space would have been. It's literally covered in gold. You see the use of mirrors, um, heavily, heavily decorated. So, um, the decorator Mansart started building the room in 1678, and the decoration, which was completed by Le Brun in 1686, pays tribute to the military victories which led to the peace treaties of Nijmegen. Um, the walls are covered with marble panels decorated with six trophies and weapons in gilded bronze. The wall adjacent to the Apollo Room um, bears an oval stucco bas relief depicting Louis XIV on horseback trampling his enemies. At the top of his masterpiece are two sculptures of theme and two captives in chains huddle beneath it. Below, in the bas relief in the fake fireplace, Cleo, the muse of history, is recording the king's great deeds for, prosper for posterity. Um, in the center of the cupola ceiling is a personified depiction of France, armed and sitting on a cloud and surrounded by victories. Her shield is decorated with a portrait of Louis XIV. Her three defeated enemies are depicted in the arches, Germany kneeling down with an eagle, Spain making threats with a roaring lion, and Holland overturned on another lion. The fourth arch depicts Bologna, the goddess of war, um, in a rage of fury between rebellion and contention. All right, so now we're going to move on to furniture, and I think you're going to recognize most of these pieces. Um, the Sadia chair we have previously discussed, but you have two new pieces in the Fauteuil chair and the Bergère chair. Um, and the main difference between these two is that the Fauteuil chair is going to have an open arm, um, so it's not going to be upholstered there, whereas the Bergère chair is going to be upholstered, so that's going to be a closed arm armchair. All right, so then we're going to look at the armoire, which we have seen before, um, and then the commode is also introduced. It's mostly just a chest of drawers, um, but it might have had a really nice shape to it. So sometimes they were bowed on one side um, and beautiful pieces, but they serve the exact same role as your standard chest of drawers. You also see the introduction of the console table, which is just a narrow table that would have been um, usually located by the entryway. It holds candles for lighting and such like that at this specific time, as well as being a decorative element in the room. We also see the introduction of the sofa. And as designers, we really want you to know the difference between 
a sofa and what we would normally term a couch. So a couch is going to be thinking back to those pieces that are similar to a sofa, but they don't have the same upholstery and fluff to them. A sofa is going to be far more comfortable, and that's why we want that to be the main use of your vo design vocabulary, rather than referring to it as a couch. Alright, so on this slide you see several chairs that you should already be fairly familiar with because we have seen these frames before. So on the left hand side you have that wainscot chair which if you'll recall has the really high back and it's generally a solid panel. Um, and Traditionally, it was members of the nobility who would use this chair. It um, gave them that extra height, that extra importance. Um, and then next to that, you see the Asadia chair, um, and it could have had a form of upholstered seat. However, here, what you're seeing, just this simple frame, is also a great example of a Sadia chair, so they certainly weren't all upholstered. It's mostly this frame that we're referring to. On the um, right-hand side, you have the cockatois. Um, so if you'll recall, this was intended so that women in their large skirts could sit down, so it kind of tapers back in towards the back of the chair. Okay, so on the left-hand side of this image, which is just for review, in this spot marked one, you see the Wanscoat chair, and you've got the Cockatoa chair below that in the spot that is now marked two. Despite the different formation, all of these chairs on the um, right-hand side, so all four, have the Sadia chair um, frame. So that's really what we're looking at to define these chairs, and you'll notice the structural supports that are near the base of the chair and how the um, legs of the chair extend straight down towards the floor. Okay, so now we have a new term that I want to go over with you, and that is ormolu. Ormolu is just the gilding of gold overlaid over a bronze, so all of their wood furniture... Um, I guess not all, but the majority of pieces that we're going to see in places like Versailles are going to have these detailings such as the feet that you can see here that are made out of bronze despite the fact that this is a wood piece. Um, areas that were made of bronze were then gilded in gold, so it has that definite extra layer of ornamentation and decoration. So then in the bottom image, you can see the bulwark, um, which is just a type of marquetry named after Charles Boulle, who really mastered this technique. So marquetry is not necessarily new. It's all of these inlaid pieces that you can see here on the front of this chest. Um, but Boulle is the most exquisite of the type of marquetry market tree that we're going to look at, and that's why this is named after him, just because of how skilled and technical he was. And on this slide, you can see the same thing. So you can see all of that ormolu in the lighter areas. You have a marble top sitting on top of this little chest, and then you can see all of the bull work that is inlaid in like this little rectangle here. And then this is just another example of marquetry and ormolu. So once again, all of the light areas that you can see here would have been gold, um, despite the fact that this is a black and white photograph. Um, and all of that would have been heavily ornamented in that gilded gold, which we call ormolu. Um, and then you can see all of the extensive marquetry that is just in these panels um, and all over the main piece. Here you can see two different key elements. You have the spiral legs um, as well as the X stretcher. So the structure is this part that runs along here and connects it and adds stability closer to the base of the table. Um, and this one is in an X shape, which is why we call it the X stretcher. 
Um, and the spiral legs get the name once again from their look. So they spiral all the way down and that would have been made using a um, like turning mechanism. Here you can see an armoire, which we have discussed before, served in the role of a closet um, because closets were often not built into these rooms. But you can still see that really heavily ornamented look um, that definitely makes this piece specifically more Baroque than what we had looked at in the past. Alright, so here are just some images for you to review. Um, and all of these pieces we have discussed before, but the one thing that I really want you to note on this sheet is the use of excess ornamentation. So we're about to go talk into ornament, um, but the Baroque really just exemplified everything that ornament could possibly be. They used every inch for detail, um, and so like this image at the top corner um, is a detail of the chapel door at Versailles, and you can see that there is almost no space left blank. All right, now we're going to discuss the use of ornament during the French Baroque period, um, and one major thing to consider is just the use of motion. So they used the large curves, the broken pediments, and the twisted columns. There was always a sense of movement that was driven behind everything. The other main thing to note is that um, there's obviously a long list here of different types of ornament used, but part of this is coming down to it's less of what they used and more of how they used it because we've seen all of these things before um, and we're going to continue to see them. But like I said, the decorators of the Baroque period left no room for any type of excess ornament. They used every inch that they possibly had um, to the point that it does seem a bit excessive. But now we're going to go through... So you can see the X stretchers with a finial, um, and then you have a Flemish scroll, which is part of a um, leg of a piece of furniture, and it forms almost an S shape. Then you have the brush foot and the turned leg. Um, carving was often used as well as a compass curve. You see that bulwark um, and ormolu that we discussed just a couple of slides ago, and then as we've seen throughout, you have a heavy use of gilding, so all of that gold um, is gilded into the space. We also see a lot of textiles, specifically the damask and the fringe um, textiles being used throughout this time. Alright, so like I said, the um, designers of the Baroque period left absolutely no inch spared of decoration, and so this is an image of that beamed ceiling. We did see the same beamed ceiling during the French Renaissance period, but this one is obviously much more highly decorated and ornamented. Now, remember back to the French Renaissance where we saw that herringbone pattern um, on the flooring? Versailles really changes that up and becomes, um, or sorry, and develops a different type of parquet flooring. Um, and we refer to this as the Versailles pattern, and it is a signature of the Baroque style. Um, but we will also see it continued on throughout history. Um, into some American buildings as well. All right, so here we have a console table. So as you can tell, it's a very narrow but long table that they could have set candles or um, other things on, specifically used near an entryway. This detail here that has kind of a funky shape, that's going to be the Flemish scroll. Sometimes that would be used on the leg, sometimes it's used on the stretcher like this, but that shape that you see um, is what we refer to as a Flemish scroll. All right, so the very last thing that we're going to go over is just a simple review of the marquetry, which you can see up here. Um, it's all of this detailed scroll 
like work that's going on in this space. And then you can also see the Ormolu, um, which is all of this gilded gold that you see here. So all of that would have been bronze, which was then gilt with gold. All right, so that is all that I have for you today. Um, so good luck with the rest of your module, and we will speak again soon.